there's the the donkey our resident donkey is actually oh, no. in this virtual background <laughs> usually just you know covered up wherever we are but yeah i am i'm in my office in the brewery today so very cool that's very meta um that's awesome <laughs> yeah otherwise you have to pay the donkey wrangler and you never know what he's gonna do i so, know yeah, yeah we don't really let the donkey greet many of the guests <laughs> <laughs> He's an ornery donkey. <laughs> we do we have one that is quite ornery. So <laughs> that's so funny. Well, let me give you the official Beernet Radio welcome today. We'd like to welcome to the show Ellie Presslar, CCO of Sierra Nevada. Uh, Ellie came to Sierra in 2021 from Proctor when she joined Sierra as VP Sales, and now she heads up all the commercial ops, including sales and marketing. You've presided over some great trends lately, even as craft has sort of struggled. You guys have yeah. been among the top beer gainers for absolute dollars. Um, and so welcome to the show. Uh, glad to dig in. Thanks. I'm excited to join you all. Awesome. Well, just a couple from me and then I'll kick it off mm -hmm. to Jay. But you became CCO in May. Mm -hmm. uh, C There's a new CEO as well, Price Greeno. Yes. Did I say that correctly? Greeno. Yes, that's right. Awesome. And, and he's from, I believe he came directly from Suntory. So you guys are you like, did. yeah, leveling up, right? Coming from all sorts <laughs> of big CPG, even though, you know, Sierra is one of the OGs in craft. So does yes. this, this make Sierra feel like a different company in some ways or describe the vibe over there? Yeah. You know, um, I think for me, it, it doesn't really, because we still, if you look across our leadership team, um, we really are a mix now of internal and external hires. Mm -hmm. And frankly, from a mix of backgrounds. And while, yes, Price came from, from Beam Suntory, he'd had a long career of working across BevAlp, never in beer before, always wine and spirits, at a variety of different sized companies. So Beam Suntory most recently, but had some experience, unlike me, who'd spent you know 17 years only at Big CPG. Yeah. And then as you look across even our, you know, our other external hires, there is really kind of a mix of backgrounds. And I think what I've really appreciated that um, the board and, and Ken and Brian and Sierra have been really deliberate about is I think while while bringing some of us on with some different experiences, they have been really incredibly focused on finding people that fit the culture of Sierra that we've had for the last 44 years. Uh, so obviously you should ask some more tenured employees if we're, we're doing okay on that <laughs> regard. Um, but I think it's been a really fun, fun mix, even for our, our long tenured employees. And I continue to love and appreciate so much of the, the culture here and where we're headed. So. Nice. Yeah. And, I, you know, they're having been to the brewery and interviewed you guys and had a relationship with Sierra for a long time. There is a yeah. secret sauce culture, right? Like <laughs> that is part of what makes you guys it's a you. a special place. It yeah. is. It's a very special place. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, well, let's see. So let's just cut right to the chase. The mm -hmm. Little Thing franchise, Hazy Little Thing is coming up on like its seventh year of growth. That's now. right. Yes. That is and then correct. you guys have all the rotators and yeah. it, all of it. And that's what's really driving growth for you guys. How are you mm -hmm. pulling that rabbit out of the hat? <laughs> yeah, I honestly, um, it is such a, a jewel for us and has been now for, for seven years. And I think it's because we've been really focused on consumers and, and customers. And we let, you know, hazy little thing as the, the icon of that family really kind of grow and develop. And right now we're still able to do that while we've listened to some of our customers who've said, we want some more hazy from yeah. you all, right? Which is why we introduced the rotator. We've launched uh, a variety, hazy variety pack, right? This year, which is already um, in the last four weeks, like the number one, you know, craft beer variety pack. Mm -hmm. um, while hazy little thing, our core six packs, 12 packs and singles continue to grow. And I think what's really interesting is we're seeing in the data that hazy little thing continues to bring in new drinkers mm -hmm. and it's bringing in new craft drinkers. So about 5% of the volume that we're seeing in hazy is coming from new craft drinkers. And as someone who is a long lover of craft beer, well, before I worked in this industry, and really um, saddened by the recent trends and know that we'll get through them. I'm excited anytime we find things that bring new people and people, you know, to craft um, because I, you know, love and care deeply about this, this business and this segment. So, yeah. Yeah. Are those new craft drinkers, do they tend to be like new LDA drinkers or are they older drinkers that just haven't really drink yeah. drunk craft or, or... <laughs> it's it's honestly a mix they do tend to be more millennial and then emerging ldas which you know sit in gen z um but we're kind of it's a it's a wider age range than you know just only being emerging ldas so for sure 
Yeah. Well, kind of going back to where we started, um, you know, there's a mix of internal and external and coming from all different backgrounds. Can you kind of share the collective vision or focus? Um, is it still more towards craft or is it more towards all BevAlk or total beverage? Yeah, I think as Sierra Nevada, we are still very focused on craft beer and that isn't going to change. It's still going to be the cornerstone of who we are. And we fundamentally believe we can grow within craft beer. I think we're delivering that this year, despite the challenging headwinds. And I, I think, you know, we don't want to lose sight of that. Are we going to continue to look at other segments? Sure. Some of that we're going to do through third party partnerships, right? So as you all know, we have um, a new facility out in Chico that does enable us and give us some different capabilities that we haven't had in the past. Uh, to date this year, that facility has really been focused on pumping out Trail Pass, our non-alcoholic launch, and our hot splash extensions and volume. But we have moved Riot Energy Drinks into production there. That's you know a third-party partner, which as you know we've announced, we do have an equity stake in them as well. Um, and then we have some other third-party business that's going through there, and it's a way for us to like expand and diversify our revenue sources. Honestly partner and learn with other folks who are like-minded from a quality uh, standpoint, um, but not necessarily always participate, you know, ourselves from a distribution, a sales or a route to market perspective, but use our expertise on the operations, the manufacturing and the quality side to, to learn and support others and other growing you know, BevAlk segments. So that's how we're thinking about it right now. Okay. So um, you have non-ALK and then you have energy can you share kind of some of the other stuff that's going on at Can Do right now? Yeah, um, I can't share any official partners, right? There's NDAs that are unique to each and every agreement that, that we do from a production standpoint. None of them are in spaces that we compete in. So I can kind of share that generally. Um, and um, I got, well... And I was going to say that all of them right now are, are variations in, in non-out spaces, but that's you know not actually true um, uh, either. So so they are kind of a, a mix. But the cap the facility has cap capability. Um, we are licensed there for wine based, spirits based, as well as malt based. So really broad from a bad out perspective, right beyond commodities that we compete in as traditional Sierra Nevada. And then we have a lot of capability to do anything you know from a non alk space, whether that be you know juice. Um, whether that be energy drinks and, and variations of, of that. So, okay. So nothing's really off limits there. It seems like uh, nothing is off limits <laughs> unless it doesn't meet our quality standards okay, and fair ingredient enough. practices. So those, those are off limits, but yeah. yeah. Um, well, kind of picking up on non-alk and trail pass, um, you know, how has that contributed to your growth trends this year? And also how do you expect, how do you plan to expand that franchise or will you uh, anytime soon? Yeah, um, it's definitely contributed to our growth trends this year. No, no doubt um, Trail Pass and Hot Splash um, have both done so. We're really excited. It's very early, right? Trail Pass has been out for you know, six and a half months really at this point. But if you look at the results, you know, we have two SKUs, right? That we have in national distribution, the IPA six pack and the golden six pack. The IPA is now the number two non-alk IPA um, in the US and the golden's the number two non-alk um, golden, right? Six and a half months in. And so um, that is really exciting. And I think shows the quality and time that went into developing the liquid as well as frankly, the trust folks have in the Sierra Nevada brand, right? To try a non-alk um, from Sierra Nevada and have trust that it's gonna deliver on the promise from a great you know, liquid perspective. And we're gonna continue to fuel that growth. We have a Trail Pass variety pack, which in addition to the IPA and the Golden has a hazy IPA and what we've kind of coined a brew Vesa, uh, which has a little bit of lime and sea salt in it, in that Trail pa um, variety pack. And that's been in about four markets since call it late May, early June. And that will expand to more markets this fall and then probably continue to roll out expansion as markets are ready and as chains you know, do resets as we go into next spring. In the four markets where we have that, it's actually exceeding rate of sale than over even some of the six pack SKUs. People really, I mean, we see it everywhere. That variety pack is has such an appeal. 
And, and there are a few variety packs in the NA space, right? Brooklyn has one, BrewDog has one. Um, but I think um, our ability to have one, and it's a little bit of a unique take on it with the mix of, of beers that are in there, uh, has been, uh, frankly, exceeding our expectations in those four markets. And we're excited to, to get that into to more hands. Can you talk a little bit about the route? It seems like craft brewers have done, um, they've gone on a venture where they actually create a new brand for their non-alkaline. And then the bigger brewers just kind of line extend and say, here's blah, blah, 0.0. Yeah. Um, can you talk about those different routes and why you think, um, you know, building a new brand might pay off longer term? Yeah, I honestly think it's, um, it's a really interesting insight to think about it from the choice that you see within craft right? Versus what you see with some of the other larger, um, you know, import and domestic brands. And I don't necessarily think there's a right approach or a wrong approach. I think that it's just really exciting to see the depth um, and diversity of products that are coming into that non-alk space. And frankly, how the quality has been raised so much in the last few years. Um, and so that part of it's really exciting for us. as we thought about it and we looked at it, you know, pale ale and hazy little thing are our kind of crown jewels and pale ale in particular, right? One of the OG craft brands that while not growing the way we would like to see is still one of the largest of the OG craft brands and, and still a top you know, craft brand. And if we were to do a non off version of that, we would want it to match and deliver on all of the expectations of pale ale. And I just think we just kind of decided, you know, that's not what that drinker is looking for. That's not right for us. We're going to keep pale ale in the pristine state that Ken designed over 40 <laughs> years ago. Um, and keep driving that. And we decided that, you know, we didn't want to have our non alks have necessarily an alcoholic comparison, because while we think our non alks have uh, the mouthfeel and the flavor profile of an alcoholic beer, it's still different than any of our, our alcoholic counterparts. And so we really wanted it to be a little bit unique and also, frankly, just differentiation. So there's not... Um, confusion at shelf for consumers. So folks know when they see trail pass, they're getting a non-alk, right? And if they don't have trail pass on it from Sierra Nevada, then it's probably an alcoholic beer too. So it, I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong. It just felt like the right approach for us to take. Yeah. I'm curious, how big do you guys think non-alk can get? I mean, I don't know if you can share, you know, longer term, <laughs> how big of your portfolio do you think you can get to? Because some people think it's like, the next yeah. big thing, right? And others think it's just a little mm -hmm. bit of a flash in the pan will never be Europe, right? So what can yeah. you share? Oh man, we debate this all the time, especially with Christ <laughs> coming on board, right? Who's spent a number of years in Europe over the course of his career in the international markets and then had previously been in the US when non-alk was just really not, mm -hmm. for most part, thing. non-existent here. Yeah. So I think he was like, oh, wow, this is happening, but it's still different, right, than Europe. And right. so um, lots of fun debate. I, it's one of my most fun things to read about with um, different industry publications and data sets. I think it will continue to grow um, in the US. I think it will take a, a while mm -hmm. if we get to the size of Europe, mm -hmm. um, because I do think, I do think you'll have double digit cakers for quite a while. I think you've got a long runway of that, but my gosh, it's still an incredibly small segment of beer. It's bigger, right? Of craft than it is total beer, but it's still really small. So even at that double digit caker, it's going to take a while to catch up. But I, I believe that um, just because I think there is this overall you know, trend, and we've talked about it, of moderation and, and people using it for different occasions. And sometimes it's not even moderation. I mean, I you know, work in our North Carolina brewery based on North Carolina you know, law and even practices. If I'm going to go into a production part of the, the brewery, I'm not going to be able to drink a beer if I eat lunch here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but you know what? I can have a trail pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't in my consideration set before. So that's really you know, great. So there's it delivers beer at more occasions for people too. So I even think beyond trend of, of um, moderation, there's just more occasions now that folks have beer in their consideration set. And I think that's really exciting. And so I do think we'll continue to see growth. I, I go back and forth. I don't, I think it'll take a long time for it to get to the, the size of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's going to be other things that right emerge 
um, in other intoxicants, other beverages and things. I mean, you all are writing and talking about it all the time. It's fascinating to, to follow and, and watch that um, I think will probably just give people more choices. And that's not a bad thing from a consumer point of view, right? Right. So then, of course, I have to ask that you... <laughs> You open the door. (laughs) This intoxicating hemp, I believe you're talking about. Are you guys looking at that at all? Um, Am I studying it? Absolutely. (laughs) Like, do we have any plans? No. But I I, I think it's fascinating from a category and a segment perspective. And um, it's one of the things that anytime I'm out and marketed with wholesalers, I'm asking them about because I think, and I'm sure you all hear it too, like all over the board, right on opinions, but I think regardless of anyone's personal or business category opinion, they're following it really Mm -hmm. closely. Mm -hmm. And I even think everything right now, I think because of the farm bill and different state legislation and things is really focused on intoxicating hemp, but there are a lot of interesting emerging ingredients and trends that are out there. Mm -hmm. So I think even if, if hemp goes, I I think there'll be something after that and that. So I think that's just a really interesting space to, Mm -hmm as someone who likes beverages and works in this business to, to learn and understand. Right. Yeah. Kava and Kratom, Kratom. I don't know how you pronounce it, but that we're all, all sorts of functional There's, things, some yeah. of which may be viable and some, right. some which might cause liver exactly. damage, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> or pelvic, like, yeah, you know. Okay. But I, you know, it's better to read and, and, and learn. I'd be curious always. So. Right, 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 right. Well, I have just a couple, you know, 30,000 foot questions for you. Of Uh, course. You guys have had a couple of great marketing initiatives over the last couple of years as well. I mean, one of the big criticisms of craft Mm -hmm. is that it hasn't marketed, but certainly you guys have marketed. Um, And, you know, you had the still the one campaign and now you all have Mm -hmm. the keep it in the family campaign. Are those resonating? And and what's the direction forward there too? Yeah, um, I... I thank you for acknowledging the the work that we've done on that front. It's the one I'm most excited about as we bring sales and marketing back together you know, since Joe retired a few months ago and, and runs in the family is off to a really good start, right? It really just hit market over the last month and a month and a half, and, but it's really resonated with our wholesalers, um, but we're also hearing it right from a consumer and a retailer point of view. Uh, it's just, it's a different enough right? Mm -hmm. But drives home, I think the point of what makes craft unique in that we're small, independently owned, not all of craft, but that, that ethos and mindset that comes with, with being a craft brewer, I think it hits on. And frankly, for us, I mean, you talked about, we opened, right? The really special culture we have here. It's not just because we are family owned by the Grossman family, but how they have extended and made all of us part of that broader family. And so one of the really fun things about the campaign is all of the individuals featured are actual Sierra Nevada employees oh, cool. um, because it really is right. We wanted it to be very true to we are and consider ourselves, you know, a really a big uh, a family and how we operate and, and go to market. And, you know, as wholesalers who many are family owned and have long family ties, that's been you know fun to, to talk about with them as well. Cool. Yeah, that's that's uh that's fun. It it is great too. I mean, you you think of Sierra and you think of Ken Grossman and his tinkering and right, yeah. like you guys have like a haul of all the things he's bought on eBay, right? We do. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty yes. cool. Yeah, it is. that's awesome. Well, you know, you probably don't want to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. <laughs> but maybe it's easy, you know, being that it it is such a family owned centric mm-hmm. business. Is that the plan going forward, right? To keep it family owned? Yeah. I, I mean, yes. <laughs> Ken still chairs our board. Um, he's still, when he's in Chico or Mills River, he still shows up at the brewery and tinkers yeah. and, yeah. Um, you know, it does it, is it not necessarily in all the day-to-day, but still intimately involved in almost every decision we, you know, we make in some way, shape or form. And then Brian is now our chief mm-hmm. brewer. And that I think has been, I mean, he's worked right here for a long time and really understands the ins and outs um, beyond just being a family member and um, being the chief brewer now and overseeing all of our brewing and quality and technical um, departments and teams just really puts to the forefront what we have valued and continue to value. Um, And for him to lead that as a family member, I think is really special and just shows the continued commitment of all of the Grossmans to Sierra Nevada. 
And then Sierra is still a very active board member. She still does a lot of our community community involvement and engagement as well. So it's it's rare a day that goes by that I haven't had exchange with at least one of the the three of them on something going on with the business. Yeah. I wonder how young Brian and Sierra were when Ken first dragged them to the brewery <laughs> with like a monkey wrench and said, like, get to work, you know. <laughs> I, I have heard I think both of them were very, very young. Um, yeah. you know, Sierra, I will tell you she came before the, the brewery officially. And Brian talks about growing up in the brewery, right? This was always his playground. This was, you know, really kind of where where he grew up. And so that's really cool. See, he his kids are here now, right? And around yeah. a lot. So they're continuing awesome. that through the next generation. Very cool. Well, what else? What haven't we touched on? Uh, how about draft? I mean, what can you say about draft trends, the on-premise? We know, you know, from talking to other companies and just looking at the data that the consumer mm-hmm. may be pulling back their spend a little bit. And I feel like that hits the on-prem more than others. So yeah. what are you guys seeing? I we're definitely seeing that that the on the on um premise in general and, and draft in particular. Mm-hmm is um, softer than we might have thought it would have been. Now, I will tell you, Hazy is totally like in, flying in the face of that trend from a draft and on-premise perspective. But overall, the business is definitely softer than we would have um, projected. And what I hear consistently too, from both accounts and wholesalers is, you know, that's pretty prevalent throughout um, beer. And, and I even think in wine and spirits a little bit, on-premise is just soft, even when you talk to some of the, the owners, whether they be at an independent you know, restaurant or bar, or some of the, the larger regional chains. We also had a little bit of a tougher start to the on-premise with um, seasonal. Seasonal is a big part of our on-premise business in addition to hazy and pale and hot pull at Magnum edition, delicious beer. But you know, with that Imperial IPA north of 9% ABV, it's not the strongest on-premise play. Now that's come roaring back with Summerfest and now seasonal is positive in the on-premise for us year to date, but we had a little bit of a hurdle to, to overcome in the, in the first quarter behind um, Hot Bullet with that. So we'll, we'll continue, I think, based on the success of Summerfest and then Oktoberfest to follow and leading into celebration, which is our biggest mm-hmm. you know, on-premise seasonal. Nice. Very cool. Well, yeah. And that, you know, there's not not much of a winner anymore in some places. So, you know, the big, the high ABV (laughs) when it's not quite so cold outside, maybe, but, you know, rethink our global warming seasonal strategy. (laughs) Just kidding. Uh, Anyway. Yeah. No, (laughs) it's a tough one. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's interesting times. That's for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) We can submit that as a fact. Well, I have one more. I don't want to hog it all up, Jay. I know you may have Mm -hmm other stuff too, but I've always been curious. Uh, I don't think we've talked about this before. Maybe we have Okay, coming from Proctor where I think most recently you worked in like baby goods. Was that the most recent? I did. Yeah. I sold diapers and wipes. Absolutely. So, I mean, quite different, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Could you have known what this industry would be like, right? And what, what has been your biggest surprise about working in the beer industry? Cause I yeah. feel like, you know, when we onboard new riders of uh, like, I can't explain to you what it is until you do it, right? Yeah. Like you're going to love it, but I just yeah. can't explain it to you. So I have to tell one one story about that transition. When I was leaving P&G and uh, my team there, you know, through a lovely celebration to, to send me off into beer, one of my analysts um, did a very brief statistical analysis, but with actual data that showed the correlation between beer sales and birth rate. Um, and so... We, we had a good chuckle over that because he said, hey, you can still impact the diaper business as you go <laughs> into beer. Um, but, you know, obviously I, there are some things and some challenges that are the same. We're still talking to consumers, right? We're still trying to delight them and, and give them products that they want and need. Um, and I really tried to research beyond my personal knowledge and love of craft beer before joining Sierra. I think the biggest and most positive and delightful surprise though, has frankly been operating in the three tier system because that was not something that I dealt with, right? Everything went direct into to retail or, or trade in the categories that I worked in um, when I was at Proctor. And I did not fully understand or appreciate the benefit that we get from an execution and how it extends the resources that we have to have not just our sales and marketing team, our production team, our operations team, all forces driving, you know, our business, supporting our business beyond the four walls in which we operate. 
but having that through our wholesalers and seeing what they're able to accomplish in trade and through accounts by, you know, their teams, their relationships, and in partnering with us to have another voice in the room to really grow the category and grow our brands. Um, that's been a really uh, delightful surprise that I didn't necessarily have a negative view of it coming in. I just didn't really know. And right. it's been a really uh, fun one to, to learn and understand and see. Um, I have one more. Um, we were talking about the on-premise. I would, uh, I would like, uh, you know, an update maybe on convenience. And, um, you know, there's been a big push there. Um, have you found that, uh, maybe, uh, designing a liquid specific for convenience works better or just kind of tweaking the packaging of your already, you know, established great brands, uh, going through convenience, maybe what, what's kind of, uh, resonating for y'all. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously a growing channel and class of trade, I think for beer, for craft in particular, and we are having some success there. We have some focus there. And I think we've learned a few things. Um, I think from a singles strategy, there is benefit in having either a liquid and or packaging that's really designed to show up in that single format. And some of that is right. Some of the higher ABV kind of, you know, value that you, you, that person might be looking for in a single, but also just the eye catching graphics and things that I think you need to stand out on a single shelf of cans versus when you're looking at a wall of six packs or 12 packs. And so I think that is something we've learned. I think huge credit to others like New Belgium and the industry who have done, done that really well from a singles perspective. And we'll continue to iterate and grow there. You know, Hazy is still our lead horse in convenience and still has a lot of runway, you know, from a singles perspective, we've got volume and singles growing faster than distribution on hazy, which is always a good place to be. So that means we've got distribution still to gain to catch up, but we've added, you know, cosmic into the portfolio this year, as well as atomic torpedo almost two years ago. Now, both still really growing in that channel, resonating with slightly different consumers, depending on the style and and the beer that they're looking for in that moment. But we also really have a strong six pack business in convenience. And we are really focused on not forgetting about that. Like six pack pale ale bottles are one of the highest rate of sale items that we have in our portfolio in convenience. And that's a little bit unique, right? As you see more consumers shifting to cans and we see that in convenience, but that's a package that we can't let our convenience owners and chains and independents forget about because we notice when it goes away, that those sales, it seems like don't just go away for us. Right. So, um, I think that that's something we're continuing to kind of really hone in on is okay. As we've seen this explosive growth in singles and convenience, and we'll continue to like that. Let's not forget about there's the six pack shopper and convenience. Um, that's also really important. And what they might be looking for isn't necessarily the same beer liquid brand packaging that the single shopper and convenience is looking for. And so that's something we're really talking and spend a lot of time about. And you'll see as we kind of build into our plans for the rest of the year and and going into next year. Very interesting. Um, And then just kind of on the rotators, um, you know, obviously hazy is still at seven years growing uh, up almost double digits. The last time I checked and scans. Um, So how have you kind of figured out that formula of introducing these rotators that do very well but also not taken away from hazy. Yeah. And to me, it's like, honestly, right account, right occasion and right shopper, right? I talked about, we have shoppers that are still entering craft, entering the hazy IPA category via hazy little thing, because it is such a great approachable liquid um, with just the right mouthfeel, the right kind of citrus with bitterness kind of components that it's very approachable for people, especially if they're not, really used to, or haven't had a lot of different craft IPAs and and craft beers. And then we've got consumers who love hazy beers, but want a little bit more experimentation. And that's what we kept hearing um, over, you know, after hazy had been in market three, four or five years, which is why we launched the rotator series. So the folks that, Hey, I still want to drink hazy little things sometimes, but I also want to experiment with other hazies and other new techniques and other new ways to create a hazy beer. And so that's really the role that the, the rotator series has played and will continue to play for us going forward. And I think what's been really exciting is we saw a really great launch with juicy with the first one and the transitions through the first year between tropical and dank. Then we launched um, Cosmic was the the first of the rotators this year. 
it exceeded all of those um, kind of expectations and continued to grow. And then cool little thing is our latest iteration that'll be in market for most of the rest of this year. And actually the first four weeks of cool have outsold in volume any of the other prior rotators yeah. um, in their first four weeks. And it is, you know, it's got the cryo hops. It's a really unique, obviously eye-catching package that kind of hits right at the, the summer season, but the beer is really good. And we're hearing continually like really great feedback as we do our consumer listening and um, in the markets about the liquid. Um, and so we're really excited and the, the brewers have some fun stuff planned as we go into the next iteration of that hazy rotor just rotator to just to use it to continue to experiment and showcase our our brewing shops in that space i'm curious you know the cool i was going to ask about cool little thing because yeah. even before you know it's cryo hops you're like mm -hmm. well this is a cool like i don't know what cool tastes like but i'm i'm in yeah. <laughs> yeah. right so, right it's hot but, i want cool <laughs> exactly it works on so many levels yeah i want to be cool both physically and you know the other <laughs> the other kind um are you hearing in your consumer research that you know just the idea of cool grabbed them or or how did they initially perceive cool yeah yeah it is it's like a um it is kind of an eye ear catching, I guess, yeah. name and that concept. And then like the tie to cryo fresh of like, Oh, okay. I got it. Yeah. Why, you know, there's a, a clear link as to why it's named cool, um, based on, uh, the brewing, uh, techniques and the hops that were used. And so, um, people really think that that is fun and they really like the packaging and it's, you know, relevant, um, on top of, of the liquid. So yeah. So maybe go down that route a little more like fun little thing. <laughs> yeah. We've got, money little oh, thing. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Just wait. You'll you'll see some more fun in, in Mills River when you're here uh, for yeah. the next iteration. And uh I uh, I love the creativity that both frankly, like the brewing team and our marketing and graphics team are now having in that space. So some of them I'm kind of like, Ooh, that might be too far guys, but no, uh, <laughs> really, really yeah, like so. fun ideas, honestly, that just kind of get at the heart of, of who we are um, as brewers. So it's, it's fun and more to come. You'll see it in a few weeks. Cool. I'm excited. Well, I know we've been saying this for like 15 minutes, but one more question, just one of course, of <laughs> for course. me at least. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, being that you are about to have your wholesaler meeting, your, your yearly mm -hmm. wholesaler meeting, what is say the biggest, most common thing that you have heard generally from wholesalers this year in terms of what they're seeing, what they need, what they're concerned about, what they like, you know, just one yeah. overarching. Yeah. I mean, our, lot. um, you know, I would say in broad on a mountain market and then our, our wholesaler council is a fabulous group of folks who've given us great feedback, um, on both our plans for the year in process, but also as we go into next year. And I think one of the things most consistent is they want us to focus on beer and they want beer innovation because while all of us need to diversify revenue and our portfolios and follow the consumer, right? We all love beer at, at the heart of things. And I do believe that beer can return to more consistent growth and so can craft, but it's going to take all of us, or at least a few of us that have you know, meaningful places in the market, mm -hmm. bringing the excitement and energy and focus back to what is so special about craft. And um, that's what they've asked for from us, I think, more than anything. And so I think you'll you'll see that come through in our meeting. You know, you see it come through in the marketing that we've talked about, we've been doing and will continue uh, to do going forward. Doesn't mean we won't do other things, but beer is still going to be at the heart of, of who we are. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Well, thank you so much, Ellie. It's been a pleasure to work with you the last few years. I mean, Joe, you know, couldn't have picked a better replacement. Oh, wow, <laughs> and those are, those are big shoes to fill. Those so. are, yeah. Yeah. Big shoes to fill. yeah. So thank you so much for everything. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thanks. See you next see month. See you soon. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.